Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here to introduce our speaker today on behalf of NCHIP um, and the Rainbow Center. We have a speaker, Dr. Stephen Russell. Uh, I see familiar faces in the audience, so you probably know I'm an only child and I make everything about myself. And I told Stephen I wouldn't do that, he's my dear friend, but I want to say he was my PhD advisor. So I'm very honored <laughs> and lucky to be able to introduce him uh, to you all today. Uh, Stephen is the Priscilla Pon Flan. Regents Professor of Human of Child Development at the University of Texas at Austin. It's a hand, uh, mouthful, say it five times fast. Uh, he was, he got his PhD in sociology at Duke University, and that's of interest to me because he, it kind of exemplifies the uh, inter interdisciplinary nature of his work. He was trained in sociology, he is now a human developmentalist, he, his work is at the nexus of psychology and other disciplines, and you'll see that I think today in his work, he's able to influence multiple disciplines through his scholarship. Speaking of his scholarship, he has uh, published more than 100 papers, peer-reviewed papers, four books, two of which he uh, was a first author on. His work's been cited more than 12,000 times, and his first paper, uh, his most cited paper on adolescent uh, sexual orientation risk and suicide has been cited over a thousand times. So lots of scholarship, lots of great work. Uh, he's been funded by the National Institutes of Health, um, the Ford Foundation to look at youth, sexuality, health, and rights. Most of his work has focused on vulnerable populations. Probably his most known work is on LGBT, sexual, gender, minority, health, and well-being. Um, Stephen also has contributed a lot to the professional field. He uh, is on the board of directors for Psychus, a sexuality information education council. He was the past president of the Society of Research on Adolescents, uh, an organization that focuses the leading premier uh, society for health or for research on the health and well-being of adolescents. He's done a million other things that I could spend the next hour talking about, but I'll leave it there to kind of give you uh, some context and some perspective of what Stephen's been able to do. The last thing I'll say is. Uh, what I admire about Stephen and, and people like him is that their research can go and impact policy and law and actually make a change in the lives of uh, adolescents and people. And I've seen this firsthand as a as his grad student when uh, his, his research changed uh, policy in California to uh, mandate inclusive uh, education and textbooks. So to be inclusive of LGBTQ identities and bodies and experiences. And so it's really neat to see when this kind of ivory tower research can go into make impacts uh, in policies and laws across the nation in Stephen's case. So I'll stop there. I'll, I'll say that Stephen's talk today is LGBTQ youth today. Why aren't things getting better? And please welcome, help, join me in welcoming Stephen, Dr. Stephen Russell. Yeah. I am so glad to be here. <clears throat> so many good friends, um, people that I've known for like, I was trying to think of how long I've known some of the people in the room, like it's been a long time. Um, and Ryan, who was one of my great joys, is having terrific grad students and postdocs, and Ryan is one of my terrific people that I, got, that, I get to work, that I got to work with for part of my career, which is really gratifying and amazing. And um, <clears throat> I really appreciate the invitation to come and talk with you. This is, seems so incredibly formal, which is nice, but you're all kind of in the dark, you know, so I'm trying to make eye contact a little bit. But um, what I'm doing today is I want to talk, I, I, I was invited um, a year ago to give a plenary address at the Society for Research and Child Development, which is next week. So this is, I'm just, I'm just totally disclosing. I'm practicing my talk for next week. <laughs> but I took that invitation, I took that invitation to give a plenary address as an invitation to like make myself stop and think. Actually, we were just talking about this. And because I have been troubled with, the, the backstory to this talk is I've been troubled with a lot of contradictions I see in the, in the research that I do and in the public discourse about kids' lives and in what's happening in everyday, everyday world. I, 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 have a, I have a son who is uh, queer and was a teenager, is now 23. So I was a parent of a queer, an LGBTQ kid. I was an LGBTQ. I have been studying this stuff for 25 years and um, have been trying to make sense of a lot of contradiction. And it's this thing here, especially I would say after the summer, after June of 2015, any marriage equality, is that I've had lots of people uh, reporters, meaning uh, uh, you know, well-meaning and, and well-educated people in many respects, say to me things like, "No, isn't it, like are we now done now? Like, no marriage fixed." Uh, and uh, the data aren't showing that. 
And I have been trying to figure that out. And in fact, it was Ryan, some of Ryan's work with his uh, postdoc mentor at, at British Columbia, University of British Columbia, that provoked me a little bit. Like, why aren't things getting better? Um, and why wasn't I finding that in my work? And so um, that was my invitation to like stop and sit and think for a bit. And so that's what I want to talk with you about today. Because we have like two decades of research that documents the health and well-being of LGBTQ young people, and lots of it is focused on vulnerability that we know about. And in the last decade, we've actually learned uh, that we've, we've been able to directly trace those disparities to stigma and discrimination and prejudice that exists in the lives of uh, LGBTQ young people. But at the same time, there's been this dramatic pace of social change that has led to this sort of ethos that everything, that like, you know, to quote something we all are familiar with, it gets better, right? So we're, we're living in this world where we're being, taught, we're being constantly told things are better, which, I, which is one, an interesting dilemma. You know, if, if you're experiencing something that is not objectively better, like, what's that about? What's wrong with me if things are better? Um, and so I've been thinking about how that, how it's historical, how, how these kind, how living in this historical moment, what it means for young people. I will say this is... I also wrote this as a, uh, as a thought piece for Research in Human Development. It's an article that will come out. It's great timing. It's coming out this spring in the first issue for the year for the, uh, the journal called Research in Human Development. So what I'm going to do is tell a little bit about queer history of the United States in the last generation <clears throat> and how and the changing what we know about coming out and the changing attitudes and social you know, meanings of uh, LGBTQ lives in the United States and present to you <clears throat> my, an argument that I'm making, and this is really the point for Society of Research and Child Development, about what I think I see as a developmental collision, a collision between the current ethos that we live in and the, lives, and the real lives and pressures of being a teenager today for young people, a developmental collision with time and history. And then I will unpack that, and I'll you know, try, to, try to convince you <laughs> that it makes sense and you know, see, if you, you know, go with, see if you you know, see if you buy my argument. But for those of you who don't, you know, who don't every day think about, you know, LGBTQ lives in history, let's just think back to, you know, a lot of people trace the beginning of the, uh, this is, a, you know, we can trouble this in many, many ways, but lots of us point to the, this 50 years ago, uh, this June, will have been the riots at the Stonewall Inn. Probably everybody here is familiar with this, right? Everybody knows Stonewall. Everybody in the United States knows Stonewall. By the way, it is more complicated. There were, other, there were a lot of other things that happened before, during, and after Stonewall. Um, but there were, you know, there was this, Stonewall, it, it did create the beginning of uh, the modern gay liberation movement, which is now the, the LGBTQ, sexual gender minority rights and uh, global movement. You know, it was a long time later that the CDC named AIDS the Defense of Marriage Act in 1996 under, in, a, in a democratic presidency, Clinton, but then, you know, the next year Ellen DeGeneres came out and for people, you know, for people my son's age and younger who, don't, who weren't familiar with the media discourse before 1997, there was nothing. There was no such thing as a gay person in public media. There were, now, asterisk, let's talk later, there was, you know, there was the character on soap, you know, in the, in the 80s. But there was really nothing. And, the, and Ellen came out in primetime television, and like a year later... There was not a successful television show that did not have some kind of gay character on it. Now, of course, we, it introduced all the stereotypes, and now we, you know, the gay character is always the jester or the fool, you know, all those things that are problematic, right? But, but it was a real turning point in sort of cultural uh, visibility around LGBT issues. Massachusetts is the first state in 2003. <clears throat> Several years, five years later, California passes Proposition 8, or people familiar with Proposition 8, which was the uh, ballot amendment in the state that limited... Um, uh, marriage to one man, one woman in the state of California. So this is like the place that we think of as like, you know, the lefty spark part of the United States, and they pa and it passed a, a voter amendment. And then in 2015, as I mentioned, marriage equality. I will also <clears throat> point out that there was some other stuff going on that's pertained more directly to the lives of young people that I'm putting kind of to the bottom end. Glisten is founded in 1990. The Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network is what it's called now. That's not the original name. Matthew Shepard was murdered in 1998, the year after Ellen came out, and I think that's, it, that was an, everybody who was a young adult at that time was riveted by that moment. Matthew Shepard, if folks don't know, because it's now the 25th anniversary, is that right? The 
25th anniversary of his death was last year. Am I getting the numbers right? No, something. 30th, 20th. 20th is only 20? No. I'm just adding. You know, <laughs> time flies. But um, it was this moment that galvanized people around homophobia that we'd never seen before. I mean, suddenly there was a sympathetic homosexual. I'm using that word intentionally. Um, there is an important uh, legal case in the state of Utah banned all school clubs in order to not allow a gay straight alliance club in schools. This case was taken all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that, in fact, schools public is part of civic life and you can't ban civic participation in school. It's a long story, but a really important case that said, no, you can't, like, if you can allow, you, you've, you've got to allow people to have social space and you know, you have to have, like, anybody should be able to have any kind of club they want is, if it's not inconsistent with the education mission of the school. Um, California AB, the California passed the first inclusive non-discrimination act for education in, uh, in, the, in the country in 2000, in the year 2000, which was, uh, it incorporated uh, non-discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity and expression for Department of Education in California. So that was, this was a huge, kind of the first in the beginning. So that's really, that's not that long ago. That's 19 years ago that we had the first Inclusive Education Act in the United States. And then um, I'm putting here, just because, uh, you know, my rhetorically uh, annoying failed Federal Safe Schools Acts, we have had since, 19, since 2007 in the introduction over and over and over again of efforts to make a federal uh, non-discrimination non and anti-bullying uh, statute that would apply equally across the United States of America. I didn't look. I should have looked to see whether Connecticut has a state-level protection based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and schooling. Does anybody in the room know? Yes, good, yes. So you're one of 34 states, not like Texas, that does not have that. Um, but you see, we don't have the public will yet in this country. I'm just like, it's 2007, and 9, and 11, and 13, and 15, and 17. And it goes on. So this, this like, uh, the, uh, part of this also shows that like, there, there's just been, there's been a lot that's happened in the last 20 years uh, in the lives of LGBTQ people and especially young people. And I think um, <clears throat> when we, th that has contributed to this ethos that things are getting better. This line is, uh, uh, I've, got, I want, I've got to quote this because it's so uh, completely hard to actually believe that this is a question that was on the uh, General Social Survey starting in the 1973, which is, and what about a man who admits that he is a homosexual? Should such a person be allowed to teach in a college or university or not? OK, well, that's me, by the way. <laughs> like, I'm teaching you, some of you are students. I'm the homosexual in a university. Um, and like, literally, in 1973, you know, 48% of US adults were opposed to my being here giving a lecture to you as the homosexual, the homosexual. Now, it's not so great that still 12% of people in the United States are opposed, but this is a dramatic change. Like, can, you, can we think of, it, like, it's almost staggering to think of the pace of social change around LGBTQ issues. And I juxtapose that here on the age of coming out um, in studies that, uh, of the last, I mean, the studies that we have that we can, that we have a, this is what we call now milestones of coming out. Um, so that in the 1970s, in one of the earliest studies that asked people, at what age did you first tell someone that you were gay or lesbian? Uh, the average age was uh, ar just around 20 or 21. And we've seen in the, in, during the 1990s, the average age was like 15 or 16. And now what we're seeing in studies, in recent studies really in the last 20 years, has been like age 14, 15. is when people say that they've disclosed a sexual identity to other people. And I want to bracket, and I'll come back to gender identity and expression. But with respect to at least sexual identity, meaning LGB, uh, people are coming out at younger ages. And I think that this, um, in the period of one generation, really less than a generation, to go from complete silence to a really different discourse is extraordinary and, and, and amazingly liberatory for the people who are in this category of uh, human experience, right? And so I think for myself, I grew up in rural North Carolina, and Rural Texas, but both, but then I graduated from high school in rural North, rural North Carolina. And you know, I'm not that old. And there was no such thing as a gay teenager. Like when I was a kid, there, you know, what we thought, I'm not exaggerating, was that there were like 15 homosexual men in the village in New York and another 14 in the Castro in San Francisco. And maybe there was one in West Hollywood in LA. 
And it did not apply to those of us in Altamaha, Ossipee, North Carolina. Like, that was not going to be, like, none of us were that. Of course, of course, many of us were that, right? But we had no, there was no imagination for that. And now I would assume that probably every high school around here has a Gay Straight Alliance Club or Gender Sexuality Alliance Club. Is that true? <coughs> Maybe the undergraduates, like, grew up with other LGBTQ people. Is that, is that true? I'll pretend it's like a class. Some of you are in a class. You can raise your hands or whatever. Um, so I think this is, uh, and now, I'm, now I've lost my place. So it's a historically new possibility that young people can come out. Um, and, and I think there's been this idea that this, this possibility um, is that we've sort of overcome the vulnerabilities and that there's this new legal, and, and there is objectively, new legal, social, political acceptance and uh, policy and regulation to support the possibilities for queer lives in ways that we've never had before, which is extraordinarily amazing. But I'm a researcher, and the, the reality is, and I'm a parent, the reality is, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> it's not always that easy. And things may be better, but there's a paradox that, um, you know, uh, I, so I, I guess I think we have this, we have this, uh, an ancestry, some of you know exactly who I'm picking on with this picture from a book, a famous uh, academic book of the new gay teen that suggests that everything is better, that there, is no, there are no more problems, that, we, that the world is post-gay and that all kids, nobody cares anymore about whether they're queer or not. And, um, and I think that that's a, con that's a compelling discourse, you know, to think that things are better. But I want to trouble that, spoiler alert, and suggest that I, th I think it's more complicated than that, and I'm a little bit worried about it. Um, and it is true that, you know, af after decades of research on family rejection and, like, how, you know, hard it is for LGBTQ kids with their, fa you know, that how mean their families are to them, <laughs> um, we have new research that talks about family acceptance and shows the incredibly important role that family acceptance can play in promoting the well-being of sexual and gender minority kids. We have, we have a whole dec we have decades of work, uh, but especially in the last seven to ten years, and I've done a lot of it, on schools and what makes a difference to create supportive and safe schools where LGBTQ and all young people can thrive and be happy and healthy. We know a lot about school policy. and thank, I, didn't, I wasn't even going to talk about that, but shout out to my work before. Thank you, Ryan. About like changing the, the Fair Education Act in California was based on work that we did that showed when kids hear themselves represented in the curriculum, they're more likely to go to school, feel safe at school, and do better in school, and have better mental health. Um, which was important in getting that law passed. So we know that there, we do know that there are things that make a difference, and there are some scholars, you know, and some people in particular who are arguing for an end of homophobia, that like it's done and we're, we're, the arc of that is ending. But I want to trouble that in a couple ways and point out, look, <laughs> most of the legal and social policy changes um, and progress for LGBTQ people in the last generation has actually been things that benefit adults not young people. So think military, well, and then like on the backtracking that we're in the middle of right now with, with respect to military. Think about parenting, which we're in the back, middle of a backlash right now, but think access rights for parenting. Think about rights for marriage. Think about rights for employment, which most many states have, but the, we still don't have federally. Uh, but we still have no federal legal protections for SGM, sexual gender minority, or LGBTQ young people with respect to the, most, the place where they live the most, which is in their schools. Um, and I've told you that. And, and if anything, in the last two years, if we haven't been, you know, you have to really be relentlessly not paying attention to have missed Me Too and Black Lives Matter to uh, be aware of the ways that persistent racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia are uh, white male supremacy are uh, vexingly ingrained in our culture and are very difficult for us to overcome. And in fact, are the stuff of adolescence, and we have evidence for all of them, in the persistent disparities by race, by gender, by culture, by sexuality, for young people that, that won't go away. Like we have evidence of the structural stigma that exists that undermines the lives of young people. And I, my argument as an adolescent developmentalist then is that those are the very, that's the stuff of adolescence. Those very things, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, 
are organizing principles for what it means to be a teenager today. Um, uh, and meaning, meaning it's during adolescence that we learn about those things, we learn how to reproduce those things, we learn how to conform within a world that's defined by those things. I'm not saying the world is all, always awful, but I'm saying that that is part of the world and we learn about it as a teenager. That's when we learn about it. Um, and the other thing about that timeline, and I think that, that timeline that I first showed that shows this like sort of growing volume of all this stuff that's happening in, in the LGBTQ lives that feels like, you know, Ellen came out, but, you know, and the GLSEN started and we passed a safe schools law. Most of the things on that list are actually not liberatory things. They're things like the passage of Prop 8. They're things like, you know, limitation to marriage uh, for, uh, in the adult world. They're things like the death of a young man in Wyoming. So it's not as simple as everything's better. It's like everything's more complicated and everything's actually quite, uh, quite, I mean, a lot of that stuff, a lot of those issues on the timeline point to structural stigma that would have been going on in the lives of kids. When I did my first study of Gay Straight Alliance clubs in California in the 2000s, at the time of Prop 8, a, a, a young, at that, I, I don't know, I wonder what happened to them, uh, but a lesbian identified teen was telling me about growing up in Visalia, California, a rural place in the Valley of California, and that she woke up one morning and someone had been through the neighborhood handing out signs against Prop, you know, to vote for Prop 8 to limit marriage. She said, I walked home that day from school and I passed sign after sign after sign in the, in the front yards of the people that were my neighbors growing up that was telling me that I wasn't welcome in my own neighborhood, in my own community. You know, think of what that would mean, you know? So this is not, so all, the, all this change is not all liberatory, and it depends on how we experience it and feel about it. So, the crux of my argument is that I think that there, here's the point, the development point for those of you who are the human development people in the room. How many of you, do, do y'all study human development of the students? I'm looking at, there's like clusters of students. Do y'all study human development, or do you study other things? Human development majors? Oh my gosh, okay, human development faculty. <laughs> human development faculty, you need to send all your majors to this great program at the Rainbow Center. Rainbow Center, did I say that? Yes, cool. Here's what I think. I think that there is a developmental collision that comes from this tension between fundamentally developmental processes that are true for all young people and that are being experienced in a time of changing social and structural possibilities that have really rearranged the sexual and gender inequalities and hierarchies in our culture, such that I think vulnerabilities may be actually focused or accentuated during adolescence. All right, what did you mean, Dr. Russell? What am I trying to say? So that's, that's my whole point. That's the end of the story. But I'm going to then kind of unpack it for the rest of the talk, just to give you a sense of the, the, the narrative arc of what we're doing here. And I think I'm doing okay on time. How's this going? Oh, I'm not too bad. I'm doing all right. Okay. So what do I mean by developmental collision? So there are new studies, and what I'm arguing in this paper that's coming out in Research and Human Development with Jessica Fish, but also, and Ryan Watson is really responsible for a lot of this, um, Dr. Watson, one of your professors, <coughs> is that we have evidence from multiple studies um, that we're, we're arguing that the same social changes that have created the possibility for young people to come out at younger ages in the last generation and the possibility for LGBTQ visibility and inclusion that we've seen that's really transformed society in the last generation collide with normative child developmental processes and individual development, as I just said. So young people are coming out at younger ages and are navigating intrapersonal meaning their own development, interpersonal, meaning their relationships, institutional, social, and cultural milieu that make them vulnerable in new ways. This is my argument. And, and give them opportunities in new ways, too. I mean, it's, just, it's not all bad news. Um, and that I think actually make it, make it look like maybe things aren't so different from the earlier cohorts where we were, studying, we were starting to learn in the 1990s and the 2000s that there were these vulnerabilities that we needed to worry about for LGBTQ kids. I meant to say at the beginning, like, how many of you think things are better? How many of you think things are worse? I was going to ask that question because I do, I really do feel when I talk with, like, people that I, my friends, my family, my people are like, it's better, right? Like, things are all better. So see, let, let me walk you through this reasoning. So thinking about what it means to be a young person today, um, coming out, coming out at a different developmental time. If we think Bron from, have you studied Bron from Brenner students? Okay, if we think of it in a Bron from Brennerian way. 
uh, about intrapersonal development, meaning like the development of the, of the inside, my own development as a human. Adrenarchy happens. The Magical Age of Ten, uh, Mary McClintock, Gil Hurt wrote this paper many years ago now about the Magic Age of Ten, Magical Age of Ten, which is the ad adrenarchy, the beginning of the, puber the, cath the, the biophysiological changes of uh, puberty that bring on the awareness of sexuality and sexual understanding, sexual self-understanding and se understanding of sexu one's sexuality in the world. That happens. The, the, the reason they titled this, go read it if you're interested. They, they, the article, it's written by anthropologists who call it the ad, magical age of 10 because basically across cultures in many societies we see that it about, it's like this is when sexual development begins to happen in the human species, right? It's about the magical age of 10. Adrenarchy happens. We become, we start to become understanding our sexual selves. It's also the time, it's co-timed with metacognition. The cognitive changes, the, you know, the brain development changes that lead to metacognition, metacognition, Everybody is like thinking about yourself in relation to others, be, 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 being able to have perspective. Um, and this is, you know, thinking about others' thoughts and perceptions of yourself, thinking about yourself and related to their thoughts, thinking about what they're thinking about you, about your thinking about yourself. I mean, it's one, this is when we begin the adolescent, like, our minds are blown as we begin to imagine what the world thinks about us and ourselves. This is what's happening interpersonally, right? Intrapersonally, and that really fundamentally shapes the interpersonal. Because what that, those metacognitive changes, especially, I think, and we have, you know, pretty good research on this, is kind of like the, the genesis or the basis of peer conformity and nonconformity during adolescence. It's that, that self, sense of self-awareness, self-consciousness. I would even say there's a you know, vigilance um, <clears throat> in minority stress theory, the idea that you're critically conscious of yourself. And I mean, I will say, I grew up in rural Texas and rural North Carolina. And I think I probably, I was thinking about just sitting in the Nathan Hale in the bar at Nathan Hale last night. I, I think I always know if there's a person that I read to be a cowboy, meaning seventh grade Stephen Threat, right? I think I always know if there's one in, my, in, a, in a space where I am. I think I always know. And it's always, it's like always like this hair on the back, this part of the, I'm, I'm not prejudicing against cowboys, and they're really like amazing, wonderful cowboys, you know. Um, but I think I'm like always aware of masculine mas threats of masculinity in my physical space. I think that's what I was learned as a little gay, ki as a pre-gay kid. I didn't know that there was again. I didn't even think it was me. But I think that's what we mean by vigilance. But what that creates is this self-regulation. I learned to like try to stay under the radar. We, we learned social regulation, we, and what we learn, I mean, what becomes the hallmark of adolescence, this is the middle school is hell hypothesis, right, is that we learn to regulate that in others. So what we, we learn how to be masculine, we learn what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and we then learn how to make other people behave that way, too. So this is like, we know this from all of our studies, that, okay, then take it up another level. This contextual and institutional, we know in schools that bullying is the, you know, hot, bullying peaks in seventh grade. You know, middle school is, <laughs> middle school is hell, right? This is like, we know this. We have data for this. Um, and what's happening now is that young people are coming out in the, these different kinds of contexts. Let me back up away from school. I'll come back to it. But starting with families, we think about coming, at ho coming out at home. I came out, you know, when I was 26. I was a graduate student. I had my own, I was on my own. You know, young people are c come out now in the families that where they are financially, emotionally, and legally dependent and co-resident with the people that are, you know, are the greatest stakes people in their lives. And you know, when I think about the conversation I had with my parents coming out at them at 26, if I had to sleep in the same house with them that very same day and they had to serve me my dinner that night, that would not have been a pretty picture if it had been my 14-year-old self that was in a really different place of self-regulation, of self-knowledge, of empathy, potential for empathy, uh, potential for just having an adult conversation and say, hey, I, you know, I don't really expect you to, I'm not expecting you to do anything with this information, but just to have it, you know? But my 14-year-old self might not have approached it that way, right? So we come out in a really different developmental context. And if, in as much as people are, are, are potentially uh, dependent on and vulnerable to rejection, family rejection, much less 
you know, violence or push out, you know, push out or, you know, homelessness, which are all the things that we see in the lives of LGBTQ young people in our national studies and things. You know, family, it's, it's a really different thing to come out today as a teenager if you're, because, because of the ways that we, we live. Add to this, like, oh my gosh, you know, side note, you know, we have created the most completely developmentally inappropriate, you know, structure of schools in the United States that we can imagine. Well, I'm, I'm being recorded, right? Here we go. But come on, we have known for, we've known forever that, you know, the transitions, high, the transitions we created post-World War II in the school structure of this country are, were based on, you know, the baby boom. It was, was based on demographics and high school athletics, not based on not based on developmental principles about what we know kids need. So right at the time when these changes are happening, right at the time when you're feeling, when you're feeling most self-conscious and you're in a peer group that are, you're most likely to be regulating your behavior and your feelings about yourself, right at the very same time, you're being moved from the family-based elementary school, one teacher classroom model to middle school. You probably, as everybody, this, this is old news, but you move, get moved to middle school where we actually think it's a good idea to not have a single teacher, to have multiple teachers, to not have a single peer network, but multiple disparate and fractured peer networks, to move from classroom to classroom and significantly larger, more complex social world, right at the time when it's like developmentally most challenging for us to try to make that change. So not surprisingly, the school transition is the time where we see this peak in bullying, we see peak in social regulation. Um, and then add to all of that you know, again, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Ellen coming out on television. Um, the social political climate that we are all living in makes a, big, makes a difference. I, I, will, I will submit to you. Um, we know, for example, that LGB, there's some great research. Matt, Mark Hatzenbuehler at Columbia has done this incredible work that documents that LGB adults living in states that passed ballot amendments to limit marriage um, a year later have higher mortality. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of amazing that he actually, his outcome was mortality in one of his papers. Um, higher mortality, but also higher psychological risk. Like, using these large epidemiological studies where he could, like, trace, uh, he, he used the NISARC data. To, isn't it NISARC? Does anybody know, Mark? I'm pretty sure. I, maybe, tell me if I'm being wrong. But somebody might know. But he used this big national epidemiological study to show in states the year before and the year after what, uh, health disparities and mortality disparities were based on sexual uh, identity status and showed that those, the, tran the rates of change and disparities were greater in states that had passed uh, amendments to limit marriage to one man, one woman, which suggests that this social political discourse really matters. I'm going to give you an example that is coming out in pediatrics. I'm so happy I finally got the acceptance letter. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you in this long story about this. But, Looking at homophobic bullying, um, I, in my lab, we, because Ryan was working with Elizabeth Saywick and they were doing all this trend analysis using data from the British Columbia, British Columbia Adolescent and Health Survey, I had unbelievable 15 years of data from the California Healthy Kids Survey, which is now 4 million kids over 15 years, and started because of a bunch of advocacy of young people in schools and adults that like, were really smart and got them hooked up at the state capitol starting in 1999, started asking a question on the statewide survey, the health survey, have you ever been bullied because you were gay or lesbian or someone thought you were? So these are not gay kids. These are all kids that say they were bullied for being gay. Here's what the trend line looks like. Now, um, the graduate, I'm going I'm to just back up because it's such a rhetorically good, so you might have seen what I'm about to show you. But the graduate student who was, I said, like, we should look at the trend, we should look at the trend in homophobic bullying because these friends of mine over in British Columbia are finding all these interesting trends in LGB health. We should look at that. And the graduate student who's born in China came into the lab and she said, oh, I'm sorry, I think there's something wrong with the data. And I'm like, oh, crap. Well, what's, she's like, yeah, there's the, something like bullying shouldn't really vary year to year the way it does in these data. And so there's something wrong. There must be something wrong. We're like, oh, rats, what could it be? There's, she said, and other things in the data don't vary. It's only this one variable that varies, and there's this peak at one year. And we're like, ah, oh, what is it? She's like, it peaks in 2008. And the people, the, the grad students in the, in the room who knew about Prop 8, which was in 2008, were like, uh, that's not a problem in the data. That's, that's real. That's when Prop 8 happened. 
So this is the first data. It's coming out literally whenever pediatrics. I just got the acceptance letter earlier this week. So whenever, however long it takes pediatrics to publish it. But it's the first data that I know of that shows in youth studies, not in adults, the, the meaning of the public discourse. This is a, and what we've done is both a difference in difference and an interrupted time series both show a significant quadratic increase in bullying leading up to 2008, which is when Prop 8 happened, the 2008 school year, and then a linear decline thereafter. So like the public discourse matters. We, we, will, we will, as adults, we like to think that, oh, young people, like, you know, we're talking about, you know, you know kicking trans people out of the military. You know, like kids in schools, they're not paying attention to that. Of course they're paying attention to it. Of course it's making a difference to their every single day lives of what's happening in their schools. And it may mean that trans kids are getting bullied in schools in ways that was not true before. Ah, OK, sorry. So my point in all of that is to say, if we combine what I think is going on at the individual level for kids in, this, in there, if we think in a, in a holistic, multi-ecological, uh, uh, Brennerian way about what's happening in the everyday lives of, of a sexual gender minority kid, and we juxtapose it with this you know, compelling and uh, uplifting. If you're queer, I mean, if you're if you're anti-queer, this is not uplifting. But if but if you're if you're in if you're you know if you're in support of the idea that all people deserve the same treatment, and you think this is a liberatory move, you know what I'm what I'm suggesting is that there's a developmental collision. That there's this thing that's happening where young people are now coming out just at the time when it's developmentally complicated for them to do so because of individual development and of the kinds of cultural settings that we've created in our schools and our communities and families that make that, have, have that become experienced as a collision. Are you with me? So if this were true, now that's the whole, again, that's the whole point of the talk. But if, if it were true, you know, are things, are things changing? If the, are they better? And, you know, how could they be better? If, so the proof of concept to me is two questions, but, you know, again, like, some of my colleagues may be helping me think that I'm omitting some questions. This is going to be published, but I'm really open to, I mean, this, is, this feels like the kind of like my, I'm, it's like the way that I'm thinking, and I'm, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that people will challenge me or tell me it's great, you know, great or terrible. But maybe I don't really hope that you tell me it's terrible, but two things. Like, if this is, if this is true, how would we have evidence for it? Is there less minority stress or bullying? And when, in the adolescence, the way that we've measured it for years is bullying. I mean, we could measure it with family rejection, other kinds of things. But like, if this were true, if there's a developmental collision, would we, it would have to be true. There would, you know, we, if things are better, there would have to be less minority stress. And there is an ethos for that. It's better. It gets better. At least, and it gets better is not even that. It gets better to mean it gets better when you're adult. So maybe it gets better actually fits with this. Okay, anyway. And are disparities getting smaller? And that's certainly what I think Brian and your colleagues were expecting when you first started doing those work. Like, oh, we have data. We finally have trend data. We can show that things are getting better for the LGBTQ kids. So let's start with this first question. Is there less minority stress? There's not a whole lot. I've just shown you this one study that shows this peak in bullying in 2008 that I think is responsive to what was happening in the state around the culture of, of, of Prop 8. But there, there's not a whole lot to draw from. There are a couple things. One is the National School Climate Survey, which is uh, conducted by GLSEN, and it's a national survey of LGBTQ young people that's collected voluntarily through means like Facebook and, um, and Insta, that, Insta chat, Face chat, Instagram, something. Okay. But the Nash, they, they've published a paper that's just, that they've analyzed their own data from 2005 to 15 showing a decline in homophobic name calling and bullying. So this is like, okay, that's good. Less homophobic name calling and bullying. On the other hand, Carol Goodnow and Dr. Watson have published this paper using Massachusetts YRBS data that shows declines in school violence over a 15 year, uh, over a, yeah, 15, almost 15 year period. So school violence went down, but, the, but there wasn't a reduction in the sexual minority disparity. So that's not good. Like, OK, things are getting better in general for everybody, but the disparity is persistent. And then with a former graduate student, another former graduate student, uh, we uh, published a, a meta-analysis, which is like comparing the, looking at the effect size of the link between sexual identity status and bullying. 
showing that there's a positive time trend, which means that like there's a stronger correlation between sexual identity, strong, sexual minority identity now than there was a decade ago in terms of bullying. So these, at first, and this is when Jessica Fish, the co-author of this paper, and I were sitting around scratching our heads going, is this, does this add up? How could this all be true at the same time? But really, it's completely possible that all of these can be true at the same time if the rates are dropping, but the disparities are not. The disparities could remain stable. Everything could be getting better for most people, but the disparity, the difference between two groups could be the same, or in fact, it could, um, I should be going this way, right, because I'm looking. This disparities could be getting bigger. We don't know. I mean, well, actually, spoiler alert, we do. Um, the, the things could be getting, I mean, you know, there, things could actually be getting measurably worse. We don't know. Um, and even though homophobic name calling and bullying could be decreasing overall, it could be becoming more concentrated in sexual gender minority kids. It could be what we know in lots of studies of individual schools and districts is that over time, we know in di individual schools, over time what happens is that kids special, choose certain kids to specialize with bullying. The beginning of a school year or the beginning of a six-year span of school, uh, there is more diversity in who are the victims of bullying. But by the end of school, uh, end of both a school year and of a six-year schooling period, the person who ends up at the end of that period is, becomes a, there, there be, we focus our targets on bullying. And there's some evidence, I think, I, from across these studies that what we might be doing is focusing in on the queer kids as the, as the targets of bullying. So these things may not be contradictory. So, you know, this first question, is there less minority stress or bullying? And the answer is, you know, it's complicated, but basically no. Like, there's not really strong evidence that there's less minority stress for sexual gender minority kids. That other question was, are the disparities getting narrower? Because I've learned that I can't say disparities and narrowing. Disparities narrow. It's not, it's not an easy thing to say. Um, and the answer to that is the same. It's, it's complicated, but basically no. And I'll show you quickly. This is another paper that uh, Dr. Watson and Jessica Fish, actually the person, yeah, it's all like a small little world of this, um, was involved in uh, that came out a couple years ago where, you know, what do you see in this picture? The good news is we have made, uh, or they in British Columbia, this is the British Columbia Adolescent Health Survey, um, made good progress with reducing uh, tobacco use by teenagers in British Columbia over a 15-year period. Um, but what's concerning is that the disparity between the gay and the bisexual kids and the heterosexual kids, and the, and the, the, the heterosexual plus are mostly heterosexual kids, and that's a whole other story we can talk about if you're interested. I mean, it's not a whole other story. It's part of the diversity of sexual identity, but um, someone will ask, what's het plus? And heter heterosexual plus is like, not just, not, not, all, not, what was the end? Do you know if there was a specific, I think it's not just straight. I'm not sure also. Not sure, yeah. People. But the point of this is like, those disparities aren't smaller, they're getting bigger. This is not what originally was the expectation when we started, when, when Ryan and his colleagues started the Zionist study. It was like, w we were expecting to see that overall declines in tobacco use and then like a narrowing that things are coming closer together because things are supposed to be better, because we have marriage equality, because we have safer schools, because we have these policies. And this is not what we're seeing in this big, large school, large population data. The thing that's concerning about this is that people here have been showing this now for smoking and tobacco, she been showing it for disordered eating, have been showing it for depression and suicide, it's so depressing. Um, for, and we're also seeing it now, start, some people are starting to do it with the, uh, BRFFS, the, the uh, you know, that thing of adults, the, the risk factor uh, surveillance survey of adults. So we're starting to see similar kinds of trend data for adults. So, um, you know, this is a concern. Um, and here's some other, I'm, I'm showing, I'm actually, I'll just, I'll be quick on this to say it's complicated, but all of these studies are showing that what looks like you know, progress uh, among, you know, like we're, we're making progress in alcohol, but these disparities are actually not, seem to be not so good, especially for, especially for sexual and gender minority women, and especially for bisexual women. It's an important point that we're seeing across these studies. So, there have been, to, to begin the narrative, denouement of this, <laughs> there has been dramatic changes in social acceptance over the last generation. That really, I think, 
I, I would be, I would challenge people to think of something else that's changed. The pace of social change has been greater in terms of social acceptance, social understanding, social awareness. And young people are able to see themselves, imagine themselves, envision themselves as, as LGBTQ in now and in the future and come out in ways that we've never had before. Um, and homo, homo and transphobia are pervasive and you know, perhaps, I think the jury, I, I, I do think the jury's out a little bit on this, perhaps increasing in the lives of adolescents. Kind of think about it as like, turn, you know, like if, for those of you who are old, remembering like the stereo like equalizer, it's like turning up the volume at both ends. You know, like it's not that, it's not that things are better. Well, certainly objectively many things are different, qualitatively different and better. We can understand ourselves and be out, um, but it's much more complicated. It's differently complicated. And I think that the presumptions of social progress um, aren't as applicable to adolescents as they are to adults. I mean, it's the adult people that, you know, get, have the advantage of things like legal marriage or, you know, at least for the gays and the lesbians, military service, um, which is, to me, the argument um, that I'm making for a developmental collision. And I guess the other, the thing I would say in the, the, the other sort of just underscore profound thing to think about is that we've been saying for a long time, if you take a life course view of this work, we've been saying for a long time that the health disparities that we see among sexual and gender minorities can be traced to their adolescent behaviors and experiences. And I guess I just want to flag for us, especially those of us who are health researchers or you know, family researchers, that if the disparities are getting bigger what does this mean for the next 25 years of health disparities for sexual gender minority adults in the United States? And for the systems of care, for families? I think that's really a big deal. Is this a forecast of something that we haven't anticipated when we all think it's getting better? And it may not be. Now, okay. <laughs> I'm actually not a pessimist. I'm really not. So please don't, that, I'm, one of the things I worried about when I heard there was a class, it's like I'm actually super crazy optimistic. Um, I really am. So bear with me. Let's think about a couple things, some limitations and some cautions. And um, the first, the obvious is diversity and intersectionalities. And I've really been talking about sexual identity. And it, it goes without saying that uh, trans uh, people and gender identity expression and non-binary identity and understanding of self have been totally understudied and underrepresented in the science in this area. And the few times, and the few times, the few studies that have been able to do this, at least quantitatively in these kinds of population demographics, but also then we know from our in-depth work in communities, when we have done this, is that the vulnerabilities are accentuated and you know, dramatically higher among non-binary and uh, gender non-conforming and trans people and young people. But we, you know, historically we haven't disaggregated that data or we haven't even asked the question. Um, the, other, the, other comp the other obvious issue is that race, culture, religion, class, um, until possibly, until recently we really have not had the ability to, to uh, disentangle that. And I can speak to some, there is some new work just now coming out that starts to look at those kinds of intersections. And in fact, one of my passions and I'm hoping to be able to like, the next thing I want to do is look at the intersection of LGBTQ and residential instability, meaning foster care and, and experiences of homelessness. Um, but we haven't been able to, we haven't been able to do that except for, for except for within community like grounded studies um, that aren't that aren't generalizable at a population level. So that's one problem. Um, the other, you know, non-trivial problem that those of you who are like population kinds of people is that um, more young people are endorsing sexual minorities' identity that identities than before. This is the biggest methodological issue with all of these studies. So. Um, the example is in the British Columbia data in 1998, 2% of males identified as sexual minority. In 2013, in 2013 it was 2.5%. Gaining a half percent doesn't seem like a lot, but it's 25% of the original group. It's like a lot. Uh, but it's even more for women. 2.2% uh, in 1998 and 4.9% in 2013. So we're more than doubling the sample, the, the subpopulation of sexual, sexual gender minority young women. So more young women especially, but more kids in general, are endorsing sexual gender mi more minority identities. So, you know, 
what does that mean? Is it, are, are, do, do we believe that bisexuality is you know, spreading and is contagious? <laughs> do we believe that it's an underlying characteristic that was always there and we just, some kids didn't see themselves and we're not telling us that's who they were in earlier studies? We, these are all questions that are, that are beyond the limits of our, you know, beyond the limits of our data. Um, the other thing is that these studies are limited to regions that were already progressive by asking the questions in the first place. I mean, there's a whole other story about exclusion in science of sexual gender minority. We, do, we have not even asked the question on most population surveys. So these are the places that, at least British Columbia, California, I mean, these, Massachusetts, these are places that have been, Connecticut actually, are places that have been long ahead on this. And, and so if anything, if the disparities are getting bigger in those places, should we be even more worried about the disparities in Texas? Like, I am, you know? So, so there are a couple of limitations in that way. Um, and so who knows, right? I mean, who knows if, that, if the general population has changed? Although, you know, I don't think that, that the, the, the growth in the overrepresentation of bisexual girls, who just seem to be the ones who are most at risk, would drive the disparity that much. But it's an interesting, like, we should actually probably try to simulate that or something, do some models to test that. The other is, um, you know, Bo Cleveland asks me this all the time, um, third variables, uh, developmental possibilities. Like, is there something else that explains all of this stuff? Um, and, you know, I'm not afraid of that. Like, bring it on. Um, the question being, is there some other characteristic that those kids have that is unrelated to their sexual identity, that's unrelated to the fact that they're coming out at a young age, and that's unrelated, that, I mean, that's related to all those things, but it's independent of that. That's, in other words, is there, an, is there, is there a, an explanation independent of minority stress and stigma in growing up in a hostile culture? And I think there are a couple ways we could think about it. I mean, it's an interesting thing. I'm like, you know, my evolutionary biological friends are like asking me these kinds of questions. I think it's super interesting to think about. You know, we don't, we don't, we, it, that's way beyond the capacity. You know, one way we could think about it is like, are these kinds of vulnerabilities existing before kids understand themselves to be sexual gender minorities? Well, sexual minorities. We know gender minority understanding usually emerges very young, and sexual minority understanding maybe around the time of puberty. But like, are they pre-existing? Well, the best available, and there, we don't, by the way, we don't study children, um, and we're totally freaked out to study sexual gender identity development in kids. Um, and the best data come from the Netherlands. Chaim Leroy Pat, uh, published a really interesting paper that's the first that I know of, the youngest sample that I've ever seen, that shows uh, sexual identity disparity and depression starting as early as age 10. But even then, I mean, so Bo Cleveland, I say, mm, you know, what does that mean? You know, we don't, have, we don't have longitudinal developmental prospective measures to start in childhood and carry people forward. Uh, but even regardless of a third variable option, you can't ever remove the fact that kids, once they understand themselves to be queer, are exposed from that point on, if they're conscious of it, and before, to a culture that is defined by minority stress and stigma. And so even if there might be some pre-existing thing I don't think we can take out the fact that as soon as you understand yourself to be living in a world as queer, um, you're going to be experiencing and navigating and uh, navigating in any way, some way, even if it's all good, navigating cultural homophobia and negativity. So I don't think we can dismiss that. And then finally, I think that there are serious dilemmas of interpretation and application that you know I'm concerned about. Let me say a few things about that first. One is that I. I, in talking about this just sort of off the cuff, I have heard lots of people that I think are, you know, super well-meaning people say, like, well, just, is, the, is the upshot, Stephen, that, like, kids should just wait to come out? Like, is it, is, it, is it just too risky to come out? And when somebody who, like, I really, you know, respect and like and thought was getting it asked me that question, I was like, what? No. Like, so here's the thing. All the research on adults says that knowing who you are and integrating your identity is positive and healthy. How come the research on youth says, oh, like, if you understand who you are, you get bullied? Like, so stop that. And I would say, here's the thing. We know developmentally it's patronizing and completely inappropriate. To, we, we would never tell the seventh grade football player boy, you know, honey, just, just wait until you're 19 to decide if you're straight. Because, like, we just don't know if you should be experimenting with that. And you really might like boys, so just wait on that. Like, we don't ever do that. It's so patronizing to think 
that, we, that young people don't know who they already are, right? We're like, pretty much we know who we are. Um, so that's not my, that's, and in fact, other work that I've done has shown, and the one study that I know has tried to test this, which I tried to test it, has shown that at least with cross-sectional res, re, retrospective data, we showed that notwithstanding the fact that you're more likely to be bullied as a teenager if you're out, your mental health is better as a young adult if you said you were out, if you said you got to be out in school as a teenager, even though you reported more bullying than the kids who said, I wasn't able to be out, I stayed in the closet in high school. So I actually think coming out is good. I mean, talk to me. Not, don't run home and come out. But if you're thinking, <laughs> but it's complicated. But I'm saying, like, the other, the other dilemma of interpretation is that the second big thing is that some people will say, because I know them, that I'm promulgating a narrative of risk and vulnerability for sexual minority kids. So I want to say really clearly about that, uh, because people have said this about my work and others' work for a long time, that like if you talk about risk, you're like promoting vulnerability of the gay kids, and you're just stigmatizing, re-stigmatizing kids, and you're just promoting this narrative of risk. And so to what that I want to say here, I'm not arguing that LGBT young people are only vulnerable and that adolescence is necessarily a period that's defined by negative things like peer regulation and vulnerability because we also know that adolescence is amazing and cool and awesome. Um, and it's also not only about trans negativity and homophobia because we also know that young people are like creating incredible positive change in their communities. And we didn't learn anything from Parkland. It's that it's actually the young people who are showing us the ways that we're going to get forward in creating a just and inclusive liberatory kind of world. So that's not my point at all. Um, and in fact, my point is that naming vulnerability and discrimination and stigma is not the same as perpetuating it. And that it's you know, incumbent upon those of us who have the privilege of sitting in the academy and doing research like this to try to understand what's going on in lives of young people, point out the vulnerabilities, and then figure out what we can do to dismantle it. That's the point. So, so I'm going to try to... Um, so. Young people can thrive. Let me sh and so let me show you the other, I, I, this is the teaser thing. I showed you the GSA data um, from, this is, I showed you this data that's coming out in pediatrics. Here's the real point of this paper, the kicker of this paper. So we show that there's this peak in homophobic bullying in 2008. These are the schools that had gender sexuality alliances. We show complete mitigation of the peak, the 2008 peak. And let me tell you, and a colleague of mine, I was sharing this with her, and she said, you've got to tell people what you had to do to get this published. We have sent this to, we were rejected by all the best people. I mean, pediatrics is great. But, I mean, I, honestly, I started with nature of human development. Because I was like, this is so important that we have population data over 15 years where we can show that a structural intervention, like having a GSA in your school, measurably reduces the minority stressor. Uh, homophobic bullying in schools. And we tested this with interrupted time series. We tested it with difference and difference models. We tested six different kinds of models. We tested, this is, this, if you look at this paper, if you're a grad student, you'll find this interesting. There's an online supplement that is like 18 pages long for this paper. Because they made us, they literally made us stand on our heads to get this paper published. We tested, we looked at bullying is not explained by race and ethnic diversity in schools, by school size, by social class of schools. They wanted us to, they were convinced, somebody was, one of the reviewers said, it must be because the schools are all white or all black or are poor or, no, that's not it. They, people thought, it might say, what about the timing? Bullying is higher in spring than it is in fall. We tested this only for spring. We tested it only for fall. We tested the fall and the spring controlled models. No difference. We couldn't get rid of it. The data structure, the data collected in two-year waves. Maybe there's something different. Okay, well, we tested it. Well, only the schools in the one year, only schools, nothing. We can't make the effect go away. Then we tested different forms of bullying, because I mentioned that the, the counterfactual is, did racial bullying peak in 2008? Did, no. We looked at, there was no difference for racial, ethnic, religion, or gender bullying. And when we looked at, and a lot of kids report multiple forms of bullying, so it's complicated, because they were saying that they're bullying, being bullied for their race and their sexual identity. And when we isolate just kids who are bullied only because for being LGBTQ, uh, that is the group that had the highest peak in 2008. So there, pediatrics reviewers. Um, that's the end of my story. OK, and I, maybe I'll just, I'll stop there to say, look, the, the positive thing is we know, a, we know a tremendous amount now about what can make a difference. 
And I've been studying schools for a very long time and have this whole like life where in Texas, um, I was going to say this week, but I was, my phone has been exploding with a drama that I'm having with our community partnership in Texas right now. But we're about to release a series of policy briefs timed with the Texas legislative session, which is right now, that translates the research on what we know makes a difference in schools to be useful and usable to students, to teachers, to parents, to policymakers. It's called the Stories and Numbers Project, storiesandnumbers.org. It just went live but the research brief link is broken. Don't Google it yet. It's, I swear I've been working on this so long. But these uh, research briefs that were designed to help, especially young people, take the research and tell their stories with the authority of data behind them so that they can say to their school administrator or their state legislator or their parent, this is what's happening to me in my school. And here's what the research says it means and what could make a difference for me in my school. So I think that's how like research and a place like UConn and the work that we do here in an institution like this can be, you know, can, serve, can be deployed in a way that can be hopefully uh, positive and transformative for young people. That's my ending on optimism part. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I've taken, I grew up in the South, and my dad is a minister, and his dad was a minister, and I can't tell a short story, and I've taken all the time, and it's terrible, but like, I'm, I'm around and would love to talk if people have questions or challenges or, you know, if you, I don't know, if people need to leave, of course, I understand, but I think there, we got the room for a little bit if people want to. Anybody have questions? I don't know, can we turn the lights on? Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, that's a, it's great. I mean, I think there are a couple, I mean, they're like method answers, and then there are like the bigger answers. I mean, I think the method answer is we, these models and these papers adjust for, that's all we do is, adjust, I mean, adjust, we say. And so like we've, they're not so sensitive to race that the, the effects would go away. Um, but that's, I mean, I think it's a really good point, and there are people I think, you know, like Ryan's data maybe are now, like some of the data that can like begin to test those kinds of questions. Um, the other thing is there's some really good data now that I, 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 another whole project that's called the Generation Study. Um, we're collecting a national, the first national survey of LGB um, people. And the Gallup organization, we have a bunch of really wonky methods papers, uh, population science papers, where we're showing that uh, there's pretty good evidence that even across ethnic groups, but this is a really interesting question, that people will identify, like in surveys, people know what we mean. People know what we mean about LGBTQ, and people will, uh, people want to be represented if they're willing to participate in the survey in the first place. People will indicate themselves in that group. So I think that people will know that the category doesn't represent them fully. Um, and so in our work, what we're showing is that we have, we have we do this complicated way to get people into this national survey, but then we learn the incredible diversity of identities that are expressed and represented by them. And many people, and I think that it is definitely there are um, 
there are important cultural group, different, racial and cultural group differences in that. And in terms, so that's the, that's the method-y kinds of, like I'm not, I feel pretty good, not perfect, but I feel pretty good that it's, um, that it's not like we're losing all of the people of color because they say that does not apply to me. I think there's pretty, some pretty preliminary pretty good evidence that people get that they, they, want their, they want somebody to be represented, they want themselves to be represented in the study and they're willing to say, yeah, it's not, you know, I'm not that, but I'm sort of that. I mean, I know what that is. Um, there's some interesting method. Like one of the things we've, we tested with Gallup, which is like unbelievable, is like asking people, we, the question turned into, do you consider yourself a member of the LGBT community? which is really interesting. But I think, the, I think the larger, I mean, these are a lot of these are school studies that exclude the most vulnerable kids to begin with. We have beautiful, so as part of the generation study where we did the national, um, national survey, we conducted 191 life history interviews in four communities in the United States with five ethnic groups, three age groups, and two plus gender groups. And we have these beautiful, we recruited people who were LGB, uh, the recruitment was, are you LGB? Come be in our study. And of the 191, there is an incredible diverse uh, rep people saying like, well, I, I knew it was about, this, this is another proof of concept of the survey research version of it. Because people got into our study and then said, well, I mean, I'm two-spirit, or I'm same-gender loving, or I'm pan, or I'm poly, or I'm not, I'm, I reject labels, but I sleep with women, or, or, what, or whatever it is. Um, and we have really amazing, uh, there's a whole group of people, a series of papers that people are working on on uh, kind of new and underrepresented identities um, and how people are under, because we ask them specifically about, tell us what it means that you call yourself pan or queer or genderqueer or we have some beautiful qualitative work coming out of this project. Um, and, and the intersect, there's, that is very clearly intersectional, absolutely intersectional. And I think that for, uh, gender, especially the intersection of gender, uh, uh, queer and gender queer and race, um, is a really and that's and education. I mean, it's like it's all complicated, but. Thanks for thanks for coming.